Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dan Montano, Chief Executive Officer of Zicha Genesis Medicine. I'd like to thank you for attending our webinar on stroke recovery. Can therapeutic angiogenesis enhance the recovery? Dr. Jacobs will be giving the presentation, but before Dr. Jacobs comes on, I'd like to take a minute to give you a, what I'm gonna call an overview. The overview is very simple. I believe that this section that Dr. Jacobs is gonna give you is one of the most important fundamental presentations that can happen with this concept of therapeutic angiogenesis. We have 11 brain dysfunctions, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, chronic depression, and I believe that all of those are subsets to the fundamental issue that we would call a stroke. Now, most everybody thinks of stroke as being a big stroke that hits a major artery. But as we're learning almost daily now, there are micro strokes, there are smaller strokes, there are blockages which may not necessarily be a stroke and a person can have hundreds of these and not know it. And I personally believe that that's the fundamental difference. Over the last couple of months, as Dr. Jacobs and I have been outreaching to many different experts trying to explain our concept of therapeutic angiogenesis and the hypothesis that vascular dysfunction in the brain leads to these diseases, I can tell you that I have been pleasantly surprised to talk to people that are radiologists, who specialize in looking at cerebral vascular issues. And they are so excited with the fact that they have the equipment and the technology to look at these items closer and closer. But as they've told me, we're the first ones to have even presented a theory on how we might be able to improve or repair that vascularization. And I can tell you that I am just amazed whether it's from countries like Italy or Korea, people are coming to us and saying, wait a minute, I, I can show you where your molecule might be able to change the outcome from these horrific diseases. Now, stroke affects 1 million Americans a year. I believe the rest of the world is a total of 25 million people. Stroke, normally, about one third of the sufferers die from the initial stroke. About 500,000 have very mild and recover almost completely. And about a third have continuing issues. And it is that third that we want to address. And while you're watching Jack's presentation, I would like to make the following comment, especially when Jack is into the micro strokes, is that you may be experiencing many micro strokes and not even realizing it. In the future, if we can image in advance ischemic tissue or these micro strokes, we might be able to prophylactically enhance your vascularization in your brain so that the issue of major problems from vascular disruption in the brain goes away. I'm really excited about this. I think this is fundamental. And I think it could be one of the major things and I hope you all learn and appreciate. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jack Jacobs. Dr. Jack Jacobs has been my partner now for 22 years. He is a PhD from Washington University in molecular biology. He was at Merck. He was at Hitachi Pharmaceutical. Uh, he is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I will also tell you, and those of you that have met him, he's also one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. So I ask Dr. Jack, Jack Jacobs to please take over and give you the presentation on stroke recovery. Dr. Jack. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Dan. Uh, we're broadcasting here from uh, Las Vegas where it's hot and dry, so I may be taking a few sips of water uh, through my talk. Uh, we're talking about stroke recovery. Uh, can therapeutic angiogenesis enhance recovery from a stroke? So I want to make that important distinction that uh, we're not talking about once a stroke occurs. <clears throat> Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
uh, we're talking about after the stroke has occurred, after the person's left the hospital uh, with this disability. And this is what uh, we're going to be treating. So let me give you some statistics on stroke. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, how FGF1, the drug we're developing, has the potential to treat chronic stroke. So this shows uh, US stroke deaths among adults over 35 years of age uh, from the year 2000 to 2015. As you can see, the death rate from strokes has fallen. And this also mirrors what's happening with heart attacks in the United States. Uh, we think the cause of this is Americans are eating more healthy, uh, they are exercising, and importantly, uh, they're smoking less. So this rate has fallen, but it's still very significant. Uh, this is the Columbia University study uh, out of New York City, looking at age and gender, stroke incidence. And we can see as we age, uh, strokes increase. Uh, in women, actually, in <clears throat> middle age, they lag behind men. So the women are in yellow, the men are in blue. And then as we get up into our 70s and 80s, uh, pretty much the same incidence between uh, men and women. Now this is an interesting slide uh, showing what's called the stroke belt in the United States. Uh, here in the southeastern part of the country, much higher incidence of stroke, <clears throat> especially uh, among 70 year old white males. And this has to be due to genetics and also diet. Southern diet can be full of fat and salt. So we think that plays a role there. Now, Dan mentioned the disability that comes with stroke. <clears throat> Here's a slide that shows the estimated pace of neurological loss after one has a large vessel acute stroke, okay? Every second, 32,000 neurons die. Every minute, millions. Every hour, hundreds of millions. And look at here, after 10 hours, and this is a typical duration when someone comes in to be treated for a stroke, uh, 1.2 billion neurons are gone. The brain is aged 36 years. So it's this, this group of people we will be treating with our drug to try to hopefully regenerate neurons back and get some years back uh, on the brain age. Uh, one other thing <clears throat> that should be mentioned is that if you survive a stroke, you still have a great risk of death uh, from the initial stroke or from a subsequent stroke. So after one month, the risk of death is still 28%. One year, it's 40%. And in five years, uh, the risk of death from the initial stroke or from a subsequent uh, stroke is 60%. Uh, as we know, the financial burden of stroke in the US is great. Uh, lost productivity from people who die, talented people with jobs, lost, lost productivity, people who become disabled are no longer able to work. And then the tremendous direct cost of stroke, hospital care, nursing home care, home health care, doctor bills, and drugs. There are two types of strokes. Uh, the most prevalent is ischemic stroke. This is caused by a blood clot uh, lodging in the brain or in a, into an artery leading into the brain. Causes a lack of blood flow, so the neurons get deprived of oxygen and glucose. They really need these uh, to survive. Uh, also, a clot can develop uh, somewhere else in the body. Let's say uh, a person has an arrhythmia in their heart. That can uh, develop clots and they travel to the brain and cause this ischemic type of stroke. Uh, the less common type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke, a uh, rupture of a blood vessel in the brain, uh, causing bleeding into the brain, uh, buildup of intracranial pressure, and this damages the neurons in the vicinity of the bleed. So here's just a picture of <clears throat> these two types of stroke. Uh, this is a cerebral artery that's inside the brain, and here's a blockage. This is, again, about 87% of the strokes we get a blockage atherosclerosis here, and here's the blood clot that forms. And these can be treated. If a per person gets to the hospital within four hours, uh, this can be treated by what are called clot-busting clot drugs, uh, TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, can dissolve that clot. They also have catheters that can go in there and pull that clot out. But again, that has to be done within the first four hours. Uh, 
if you give someone this type of uh, stroke where you have a rupture, uh, if you give them this drug, this clot busting drug TPA, that can make the situation much worse. So this is why TPA is given is, is a good drug when if given in time, and it's generally used uh, at major medical hospitals in big cities. Uh, rural hospitals and neurologists there are a little bit reluctant sometimes to give TPA because their imaging technology sometimes cannot differenti differentiate this type of uh, stroke from this type of stroke. Okay, so let's talk about uh, using our drug, FGF1, to treat stroke. Uh, I want to just remind you the brain is incredib incredibly vascularized. Uh, we have billions of blood vessels uh, feeding billions of neurons in our brains. And obviously, if there's damage uh, to the vasculature in the brain, we're going to have uh, damage to the neurons. Now, our drug does not grow these big, massive corner uh, brain vessels, but more microvascular vessels. And that's really where the action is happening in our brains. Uh, let's look at this concept, the neurovascular unit. Here's our brain, the large arteries, giving rise to these smaller capillaries and arterioles. So here's a brain capillary. Remember, there are billions of these feeding all these neurons in our brains. Basically, every neuron has a dedicated blood supply system, capillary supplying oxygen and glucose to these neurons, and also very importantly, removing metabolic waste products that these cells uh, generate. The blood also perfuses the other cells, making up the healthy brain, the parasites, the microglia, the astrocytes. So all these cells need blood flow to remain healthy. And one can imagine if this gets blocked uh, by trauma, by a blood clot, uh, by inflammation, uh, the neurons in the vicinity here are going to suffer. Okay, let me now talk about FGF1 and its potential for chronic stroke patients. And we're going to look at some animal data we have and then talk about the clinical trial we hope to be starting in the near future. Here's our drug, FGF1. Uh, it's a natural growth factor. Uh, it's in our bodies. I actually worked on purifying this as a graduate student from CalBrains. Uh, we use it all the time in our bodies. Let me show you one use. Uh, we use it to heal our cuts and scrapes. Here's a skateboarder falling off his skateboard. It's developed a nasty cut there and <clears throat> the scab on his elbow. We look underneath that and here's angiogenesis at work. This is new blood vessels form in response to FGF1, the drug we're developing, healing uh, his wound, healing the entire skin is an organ, redeveloping skin, regenerating blood vessels, nerves, uh, sweat glands, whatever is in there, hair follicles. So it's a natural process. We use it all the time. And we're doing therapeutic angiogenesis, where we're going to be giving larger quantities of this FGF1 drug to damaged tissues uh, where the blood supply needs a boost. <clears throat> Let's look at this process of angiogenesis. Here's a blood vessel. Here's the key interaction here. Here's our drug, FGF1, coming in to the FGF1 receptor on a blood vessel. And that kind of key going into the lock stimulates uh, an explosion of metabolic activity in that blood vessel, whereby we begin growing a new blood vessel, as shown here. These are endothelial cells. They line our blood vessels. They start dividing <clears throat> when FGF1 stimulates its receptor. And we see we get new capillaries being formed this is repeated a thousand times over this entire vessel, so we get lots of new blood vessels formed. And FGF1 is unique. It even forms these larger, uh, what are called arterioles. Uh, they're wrapped with smooth muscle cells, and these perfused the tissues even better than, than capillaries. Now, people often ask me, uh, why don't we see blood vessel growth throughout the body? We're putting FGF1 uh, intravenously for this indication. Uh, why do we not see blood vessels growing in the eye, uh, in the kidney, where we really don't want it? And let me show you the mechanism there. This is a very important concept of how our drug works. So let's say someone <clears throat> develops, uh, let's say heart disease over a period of time or chronic stroke. Uh, in the health, healthy tissues in our bodies, uh, not much is going on with the FGF1 system. Uh, here's healthy tissue. We see few FGF1 receptors estimated about 100. 
uh, not much FGF1, so really not much going on here. Healthy tissue doesn't need more blood vessels, so there's no reason to form more blood vessels. But over time in disease, we see an upregulation of the FGF1 receptor shown here. So in disease states, instead of 100, we have 10,000 of these FGF1 receptors. Basically, the tissue is crying out for new blood vessels. Uh, we need new blood vessels, we're underperfused, but for whatever reason, there's not enough FGF1 there to stimulate new blood vessels. This is where we come in with therapeutic angiogenesis. We introduce FGF1 into the system. This results in an explosion of new blood vessels that we've seen uh, in our various clinical trials in the heart and in animal studies uh, in stroke. This is an Arctic artist rendition of that. Uh, here's FGF1 in a chronic ischemic uh, brain area where uh, we need better blood perfusion. Uh, and then we come in with therapeutic angiogenesis. Uh, this is uh, FGF1, our drug, uh, saturating all those uh, receptors, and this results in new blood vessel formation. Okay, so let me go now. I'm going to show you some animal data where FGF1 has looked very good in uh, healing uh, areas of the brain that are damaged by stroke. <clears throat> this shows how a stroke is formed in humans. We got a clot. In this case, that's a vessel leading into the brain. Uh, this results in a stroke. This is shown here. <clears throat> uh, there's a core region of the stroke where the neurons have actually died. And here, this pink area is neurons that are at risk for dying. This is called the penumbra. Uh, if these neurons don't get blood perfusion soon, uh, they'll end up dying as well. So we can reproduce this whole uh, system in an animal. We can tie off uh, an animal's uh, artery leading to the brain and develop a stroke within the animal. So here's a laboratory rat that we've given a stroke to. And just to remind you, if you believe in reincarnation, you don't want to come back as a laboratory rat. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So here's our slices through a brain of a rat that's been given a stroke. This white area is the stroke volume, the dead area. Dark areas are healthy tissue. And this animal has been treated with FGF1 for about two weeks. And we can see remarkably a great reduction in the stroke volume in these animals, okay? Uh, areas have been repopulated. We think first with blood vessels and then that's coupled to new neurogenesis in these animals. Let's look at that. Let's look at the uh, vasculature in these animals. Uh, this is a normal capillaries uh, in a rat brain. Uh, not shown here, but obviously surrounding all these capillaries are neurons, healthy neurons. We induce stroke in those animals and we can see the decimation of the vasculature of the capillaries, basically being destroyed by the stroke. Uh, we give one group of animals uh, FGF1 intravenously, and we can see 14 days later, as we saw before, uh, we see new vasculature forming, and we believe this is coupled uh, to neurogenesis as well. Now the brain, if you don't treat it with FGF1, tries to recover from that stroke, but look what's happening here. We get this disordered growth of new blood vessels, uh, tangles here, these actually can bleed and lead to further uh, damage in the brain. So here we see, not quite back to normal, but here we see a much improved situation to not being treated. Now again, we, we don't see the neurons here, but there are two types of neurons that react. Uh, those that are dysfunctional and become functional again, but importantly, there are pools of stem cells uh, that need blood perfusion to be active. And it's from those pools of stem cells that new neurons can regenerate <clears throat> and repopulate the stroke area. So our stem cells need adequate blood perfusion to divide and mature. Uh, so with proper blood flow uh, in the area of a stroke, we believe these stem cells can differentiate, it's called, activate and become neurons as well as these supporting cells. They reform, uh, regenerate healthy tissue. Here's some additional animal uh, data. These are animals given a stroke in the cortical or the front part of the brain. Uh, we treat them for seven days. You can see significant, significant reduction of the stroke volume in those animals. 
Here's animals treated for 28 days. Again, this is still significant reduction of the stroke volume. Uh, instead of looking at capillaries, we can look at neurons in the treated animals, and we can see <clears throat> in the forebrain, untreated, treated, we have a higher density of new neurons. This is the olfactory nucleus area involved in smell for the animals. Again, an increase in neuron density. Now here's a, another experiment done with FGF1, and I think this is really remarkable. Uh, here we <clears throat> treated for up to nine weeks with FGF1. And we look at the same uh, brain slices. Here's one day after the stroke, uh, four weeks of treatment with FGF1. And look at this here, after nine weeks of treatment, we completely regenerate that damaged area uh, that we saw in the brains of these animals. So this is what we're hoping to do. Hope to see in people who have chronic stroke, who are stable, uh, we hope to be able to regenerate areas of damaged tissue uh, in their brains. So FGF, its main job is first it stimulates new blood vessel growth in the damaged brain. <clears throat> that leads to blood flow in the brain, uh, leads to new nerve growth. Uh, so it stabilizes uh, nerves that are at risk, but also stimulates new nerve growth from those stem cells. <clears throat> Uh, importantly, FGF penetrates the blood-brain barrier. We're going to be giving it intravenously in our clinical trial, so that's an important property of our drug that can get through the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so our phase one clinical trial, we're going to be sending applications uh, to perform this in the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, it's going to be a proof-of-concept trial. This will be the first time we've studied uh, FGF1 in a stroke indication. Uh, we'll be following a similar phase one study that was approved uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, we've identified neurologists and principal investigators and clinical trial sites uh, to carry forth this phase one trial. So here's the design. Uh, we'll be studying three ascending doses of the drug. Uh, importantly, no placebo group. <clears throat> so all patients will be receiving a one hour intravenous infusion of FJF1 uh, five days a week for four weeks. And we'll administer that through a central uh, PIC line, it's called, uh, so we don't have to be sticking uh, these patients every day to give them drug or to remove uh, blood for testing. We'll be doing safety, and the neurologists will be looking for effectiveness. And this is a proof of concept drug. So as long as our FGF1 is safe in this setting, we can tweak uh, the trial to look for better efficacy. We can give more of the drug we can give the drug for longer periods of time. So we have a lot of flexibility as long as our drug is safe on humans. <clears throat> now I wanna just mention, we're also gonna be looking, uh, in addition to neurological testing, we'll be using functional MRI to measure blood perfusion in the brain uh, before and after treatment with FGF1. And just to show you the power of this technique, let me show you a functional MRI. This is a colored, a perfusion scan. This is a woman who has dementia. She also actually has Parkinson's disease as well. But let's look at her cortex region, which is a frontal part of the brain involved in memory, and executive functioning, tasks like that. Uh, blue is normal blood flow. Uh, yellow is reduced blood flow. And here, red is severely reduced blood flow in this woman. <clears throat> uh, and these areas line up with those areas which are involved in memory, uh, executive functioning, cognition. We would expect if FGF1 is bathing the brain uh, of someone like this, that we'd also stimulate blood vessel growth, new blood vessel growth in this area, and hopefully reverse uh, symptoms of dementia in this person. Okay, I wanna mention some other stroke-related medical indications that we will be pursuing. Uh, Dan mentioned this. Uh, Multi-infarct dementia, this is lots of tiny minor strokes that occur and accumulate over time. Uh, white matter disease, again, tiny strokes which occur, accumulate, and result in dementia. And I'm going to show you a little uh, slide <clears throat> presentation on that that was done, a uh, study done at the University of Toronto. And finally, uh, cognitive decline with aging, just normal aging, why we, uh, our brains don't perform as well, why we forget names, where our car keys are. So I'll show you a little uh, video on that from a study done at Columbia University. Let's look at this uh, study from the University of Toronto, <clears throat> which looked at white 
matter disease. So here's, uh, <clears throat> as we age, white matter degenerates. So here's a scan of a 25 year old, and here's a scan of a person that was 75 year old. Okay, we're getting to the slideshow now. It's from the Neuro Kremble Neuroscience Center in Toronto. We're going to see some time-lapse photography of the aging brain. Uh, gray merit is on the outside of the brain. Here's inside our brain, these white matter nerve fibers. And this is what I showed you earlier. Here's the white matter disease in a 75-year-old. <clears throat> so they did, uh, they thought this degeneration was unimportant. But now research shows that this white matter disease can lead to cognitive decline in dementia. They thought, the Toronto researchers thought it might be due to tiny strokes, each stroke small enough that the patient and doctor would not notice, but they would accumulate over time <clears throat> and cause dementia. So they did a small study, five adults. Uh, <clears throat> they scanned their brains for 16 weeks, looking is kind of really remarkable. So here's the white matter disease. Then they overlapped on top of that a new technique, new MRI technique, which can show while they're happening. So we're going to see a time lapse over weeks. You're going to see little white explosions here. These are tiny strokes which are occurring, disappearing. <clears throat> There's another one right there. Let's have it stopped here. Let's get it going again. There's one, eight weeks, <clears throat> another one, 10 weeks. So if they zoom in on one area of the stroke as shown here. Yeah, okay. Here's the tiny stroke. We're gonna see week two. You're gonna see a little white explosion here. <clears throat> now on week 10, it's gonna come up. There it is. So it's a tiny stroke, it disappears. But look what happens. It appears now as this white matter. So these tiny strokes, which are invisible, no symptoms, appear here uh, as white matter disease. New abnormality, indistinguishable from white matter disease. So the study showed that tiny unnoticed strokes are common, are likely cause, and may lead to uh, relate, uh, disease related dementia. So they might try to prevent those strokes. We could try to treat white matter disease with FGF1. Go in there, in that area which needs new blood vessel, boost the new blood vessel cells, uh, new neurons, we think we could treat. Okay, now let's look at this study uh, from Columbia University Medical School, a very prestigious uh, medical school in New York. Uh, did a study, published it again in a very reputable journal, Cell, and they looked at why our brains perform worse as we age. And uh, time health, did a short video on this, and I'd like to show that to you right now. And this is from Columbia University, why our brains work versus we are.
are. So blood flow, important in normal aging of our brain, important in diseases uh, and, and things like chronic stroke. Now I wanna just end my talk uh, with a very, uh, I think important aspect of making our drug, making our drug for these clinical trials. And this has only been possible using bioengineering techniques, techniques of genetic engineering. Uh, FGF1 is in our bodies, but uh, they're in very, very small quantities. So this new technology has allowed us to make basically unlimited quantities of FGF1, which can be used in these clinical trials and later on when we're hopefully selling our drug. Uh, bioengineering is done in fermenters. So inside these fermenters are millions of bacteria that have been engineered genetically engineered to make human uh, FGF1. So let me just show you that. This is uh, <clears throat> a gel, a protein gel. I've run thousands of these in my career. Uh, these simply uh, separate proteins uh, based on their size. So we take, let's say a handful of bacteria from that fermenter, uh, crack it open, and then run <clears throat> the contents of the bacterial cell through this protein gel. So here are bacterial proteins, large ones, and they're getting smaller. We're applying electrical field, so they migrate through the gel. And look at it down here. Here's, uh, we've engineered FGF1 to be the most predominant uh, protein in that bacterial cell. Uh, the bacteria doesn't particularly need FGF1, doesn't really want it, but we're forcing it to make it it's a predominant protein. And then, <clears throat> We need to get rid of all these uh, bacterial proteins, which are toxic, and through multiple purification steps, uh, we end up here with pharmaceutical grade, uh, and actually this is commercial grade FGF1. We could uh, use this in the clinical trials, and also it's made in a factory which has been FDA inspected. So this is the material which will be uh, used in the upcoming uh, clinical trials. So I'm happy to answer any uh, questions now, and then after the Q&A session, uh, Dan Montana will give some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you, Jack, for that great presentation. We've had a lot of questions come in, and we'll be asking you some of them. Uh, unfortunately, we, we cannot get to everyone's questions during our question and answer period. Now, if your question was not answered, feel free to email dan at zithiamedicine.com to get those questions answered. Okay, so firstly, I had a stroke to my optic nerve in my right eye and then in my left eye later. Any chance of my vision being restored after treatment? Yeah, well, that is <clears throat> what we're going to be treating. We're, we treat uh, strokes in any part of the brain. So if you've been diagnosed and are stable after a stroke, whether it affects your eyes or another part of your brain, uh, we'll be giving FGF1 intravenously that gets into the brain, it kind of bathes the entire brain. And as I showed you, we feel that only in areas that are damaged, <clears throat> such as by a stroke, will the FGF1 be active and hopefully repopulate uh, blood vessels there as well as new neurons. So yes, uh, someone with a stroke and with, eye, with vision problems would definitely be a candidate for FGF1 treatment. Okay, next question is, Will those treated with FGF1 have to be rehabilitated? Definitely, that's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> we can regrow back uh, blood vessels, neurons, but then that person is gonna have to be rehabilitated, learn how to walk again, talk again. So uh, that's a very important uh, aspect <clears throat> of the treatment is rehabilitation after uh, they finished uh, their therapy with FGF1. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. We have another question. When is the soonest someone can take FGF1 after they have had a stroke? Right, so again, we're treating chronic stroke. Um, generally, a person will go into the hospital with acute stroke, be stabilized uh, with drugs or um, agents that reduce swelling in the brain. After they've stabilized, have been released and gone home, let's say for weeks or months, that's when we would start uh, treatment after that time. All right, Dr. Jacobs, one person asks, I had a stroke 15 years ago. Would this treatment still be useful to me? We certainly would give that a try. Uh, <clears throat> if there's still disability, we would uh, try that. And there's no reason not to think if there's damaged areas in the brain, lacking blood perfusion, 
uh, that FGF1 could not be active there. Uh, we've seen uh, in a different setting in uh, coronary artery disease, we can grow uh, new blood vessels in people's hearts that have been diseased for, for many, many years. So there's no reason to think the same thing would not occur in the brain. Now, lastly, this question goes to Dr. Jacobs. Could this be used as a proactive treatment against stroke before the actual event? Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's hard to predict when a stroke is going to occur. Uh, I think uh, it could be used proactively. For example, we saw the problem with aging with the mini strokes. So proactively there to prevent further damage. But uh, development of an acute stroke is, is hard to predict. So unless a person has had uh, previous strokes, many strokes, I, I think it'd be tough to predict uh, one to give it proactively in that setting. So that's, I guess that's my, my answer. A neurologist might have a, a different answer than I'm giving. All right, thank you all for your questions. Unfortunately, we could not get to everyone's questions during this period. If your question was not answered, please email dan at zithiomedicine.com and those questions will be answered. Now we will now be moving on to our closing statements from Mr. Montano. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Dan Montano. Ejicha is a biotechnology company. Uh, we're based in Las Vegas. We've been here now for almost 18 years. We moved up from Southern California. Our business for the last, our efforts the last 22 years have been developing a biological drug that stimulates angiogenesis and a few other things that I'll talk about. And we hope we can address what are the le leading causes of death and suffering in the world. Our business is to discover what works. And what that means is what dosing does it work? Is it safe? How do we apply it? Different ways to use it. And some of this that we're going to discuss. Now, I also want to make a comment because Jack and I are very different people. Uh, I'm always asking Jack questions about things. And he keeps telling me, well, Dan, we don't know yet. And so let me make a comment. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the other webinars that are becoming up, such as the multiple sclerosis one. And this is a perfect example for me to use this word discovery. We believe that multiple sclerosis is due to endothelial cell dysfunction, which basically means that the blood vessel cells aren't working properly and therefore all kinds of bad things happen. Well, I also believe that's going on in the brains. That may be the cause of the microstrokes. That may be the cause of the leakage in the brain. That may be a cause of a whole bunch of things where the endothelial cells, the blood vessels made up of living tissues. Your blood vessels aren't made up of copper or lead. They're made up of living tissues. And when they don't get enough whatever and they dysfunction, I believe that leads to what can be these microstrokes, uh, hemorrhagic strokes, and all kinds of things. Now, I asked Jack about this, and so that you understand, I can speculate about what can be. Dr. Jacob tells me he has to prove it. So until he can prove it, he doesn't want to talk about it. But I just want to tell you that part of our discovery path is, can we infuse this molecule into somebody who they think are healthy, such as myself, and will that help my blood vessels regenerate so that they don't have the damage, or I don't have the stroke or the microstrokes. That's part of the discovery process, and that's what we're in. And I sincerely believe that we'll be in the discovery process for the next 50 to 100 years, because we are opening up the biggest area in medicine. Part of our business is to design and carry out clinical trials, as Jack was discussing, to confirm it's safe and effective and understand how it works and why it works. Jack mentioned that FGF1 is neuroprotective, that it protects neurons. Exactly how, nobody understands why. But this is something we have to figure out why and design a trial to figure out how to demonstrate that. And lastly, we have to interact with the government regulatory authorities to obtain approval so that our drug can be offered to all of the people in the world. Now, for those of you who want additional information, we have this small booklet that we put together to explain the process of therapeutic angiogenesis, why it works, the biological activity, the strengths and the weaknesses. And we also cover three different diseases. One, the heart, where we have the most evidence. Two, the diabetic foot ulcers, where we have an amazing amount of FDA evidence. And then Parkinson's in the animal data there. 
This booklet you can obtain by just emailing me and you'll get a copy. Also, Jack has written this paper, Stroke, Dementia, Alzheimer's Disease, Vascular Disorders of the Brain. Please notice the date, it's 2017. This is when Jack launched us on this effort. And actually it was him and my wife, Vicka, uh, who had found some work on Alzheimer's and they started looking at this. And this is what took us in the pathway to pursue Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke and dementia. Now this, as you can tell, is three years old and I'm sure in the next couple of months, Jack will work on a, a more updated one. But right now, if you want a copy of this, let us know. Now, I also wanna talk about upcoming webinars. We have one coming on Tuesday, September 1st. It'll be at 2 p.m. Pacific. It's on peripheral artery disease. This is when there is blockage in the legs and people, 10 million diabetics in the United States, or 10 million people suffer with it, most of them diabetics in the United States. It's the third leading cause of arteriosclerosis death in the world following heart disease and strokes. It is something that is rampant in the Middle East and Asia. And we believe it is something that uh, our drug can grow new blood vessels around blockage in the legs, making the people's pain go away and their legs function better. Next on the September 8th, we have one on Alzheimer's disease, therapeutic angiogenesis as a potential treatment to reverse this. In the last 20 years, there has not been one new advancement in Alzheimer's disease. And Jack's gonna go through the McGill study and et cetera, and et cetera. And I think you'll find it interesting. You may find out that the difference between Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases is a location of the ischemic brain tissue. And I wanna come back here. The one after this, September 15th, is going to be the webinar on multiple sclerosis, which will be given by my wife, Victoria Montano. I would like to make sure that all of you understand, I think that if you care about stroke, if you care about Parkinson's, if you care about anything in the brain, Vic is gonna spend a lot more time discussing endothelial cell dysfunction, where the pipes break, where the blood vessels don't function properly, and how that leads to multiple sclerosis. But I also believe it's worth your knowledge to see that one because I believe it could lead to a lot of these things. A hemorrhagic stroke is when the blood vessel breaks. Well, why did it break? And there are so many things, and I think that Vicka will give you a fundamental introduction to this concept of endothelia dysfunction, which of course, Jack can't cover everything in 35 minutes. We have decades of information we're trying to share with you. Next. Our program is an outreach program to make people aware of our science. In the last week, we have probably touched an additional 200,000 people, of which maybe 2,000 have responded back to us. Some are scientists, some are researchers, some are advocates, some are sufferers. And we're learning things about our own science and how people can help us. I hope in the next couple of weeks, Jack will be able to share some information with you uh, regarding Parkinson's disease. We're also attempting to develop a network of motivated and informed individuals, one who can participate in our clinical trials, two can help us spread the word. And when the time comes that we give you the clinical evidence, you will be in the situation where you can help support it. Uh, we presently have over 40,000 followers. Over the next 60 days, we should reach well over a million people. So I wanna take a step back. We've already touched 700,000 of those. So we got 300,000 more to go in the next couple of weeks. If you want more information, you can email me at dan at zgmedicine.com. You can visit our website, zgm.care. We have additional seminars coming up, webinars. We have additional presentations. We're in this because we believe we have something, ladies and gentlemen. And Jack's job is to prove it. My job is to guess about it, which really makes Jack happy all the time. He said it's a lot easier to guess about something than it is to prove it. Right, Jack? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We appreciate your time. May God bless you all. Have a good day. Thank you.